Welcome again to The Goddess in Art. This series is dedicated to the creative power of the goddess. My name is Star Goody. My guest this evening is Dr. Miriam Robbins Dexter. She is a lecturer at the Classics Department at USC, and she has currently written a book, Whence the Goddesses, a source book. Welcome, Miriam. Thank you, Star. <laughs> well, naturally, you begin your book with the goddesses. <laughs> and it seems to me like you start off by saying, here are these um, ancient female-centered theologies. You know, you have a peaceful Neolithic Europe, which has um, many goddesses that have great powers, the bird mm -hmm. goddesses, the snake goddesses, mm -hmm. these goddesses of regenerations who are really creatrixes. You know, they have many, many powers and functions. And you also look at the ancient female-centered theology of the ancient Near East, which has the first historical goddesses in Egypt and Sumar. And again, these goddesses have a lot of power. And then over here, we have the ancient male-centered theologies, are the warlike proto-Indo-Europeans who lived in the Russian steppes. And they're goddesses in those cultures, but they're much weaker, or they just have one function, like they're Dawn or the Earth mm -hmm. Mother or whatever. And, um, and then you discuss how uh, the proto-Indo-Europeans invaded Europe and they invaded India. And so there was a class of, clash of these two cultures, which resulted in the Indo-Europeans. And basically, this created this new culture. And the rest of your book really talks about what happened to the various goddesses from these two cultures and you know, what happened with them. So I'd, I'd like you to just elaborate on the organization of your book. OK. What I was doing was tracing the sources of classical age European and um, Asian goddesses, um, Asian, Ind Indic, and Iranian. Right. I mean, of course, when you're looking at Neolithic Europe, you can't translate. You can't strut out right. your stuff as a linguist. You're looking at just the iconography. Right. So I started out with the iconography of um, Neolithic Europe, and because the, the sources, many, much of what went into creating a, a classical age goddess. Uh, is found in the iconography. There are many uh, goddesses with bird and snake mythology, for example. There are many creatrix goddesses. And then I looked at the Near East because many of the, the functions and attributes of goddesses in, in Egypt, in ancient Syria, uh, in ancient Mesopotamia, found their way into classical age goddesses as well. And by classical age, I don't mean just classical Greco-Roman. I don't mean Germanic, what you meant, Slavic, yeah. Baltic, um, Welsh, Irish, mm -hmm. um, and so forth. So what I was trying to do was find the sources. So it's a source book in two ways. One, it's a translation of texts. Right. And uh, secondly, it's trying to derive the sources of the, goddess, the goddesses in their Near Eastern and, and Neolithic European past. Right, because the structure of the book, you know, you set this foundation. I thought it was sort of ingenious. You now you set this foundation, and always it builds, and you can see, like, if it has an attribute, well, it comes from here. It mm -hmm. comes from this ancient female-centered theology, or if it comes from uh, so certain attributes, will come from the Proto-Indo-Europeans. But I, I did notice when you drove up this morning, you had a nana on your license <laughs> plate. So I was thinking that since a nana is one of the earliest, um, you know, in this ancient uh, female-centered theology of, of Sumar that that would be a good place to start for you. Maybe you could talk a bit about Inanna and her twin and, and maybe a few of your translations. Inanna is my favorite <laughs> goddess. <laughs> <laughs> she is my favorite goddess because she has so many powers. She is 
the queen of heaven. She's the goddess of the morning and evening stars. Um, she is a goddess of, of judgment and wisdom. Um, she has control over much of life. And the goddess who may indeed be her twin, but who is certainly her sister, is Arash Kigal, the mm -hmm. goddess of the underworld. And between the two of them, they have control over all of life and death, the whole continuum of the life cycle, birth, death, and rebirth. So this isn't just a bride of a male god or just some... Ah, Arash Kigal? <laughs> no. no. No, I assume that, that everyone is familiar with the story of Persephone who had to be raped by Hades, the deity of the underworld, in order to become queen of the underworld. That is, I think, a, a patriarchal retelling of the story of the goddess of the underworld. Eresh Kigal was goddess in her own right for quite some time without any consort at all. And she, she, when she did take a, a consort, it was because of the influence of the Semitic Assyrians. Which are like another nomadic tribe that another came in and nomadic over through the indigenous goddess right. cultures, uh, or I should say assimilated. Well, now these goddesses have some of the earliest uh, writings, so I'd like to just start with some, maybe there's like some favorite passages you have of your translations. Sure. Well, who do you want to hear about? Well, pick a favorite. <laughs> <laughs> or pick something you really... Pick a nana, you mean. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, later on, a nana, too, has a, has a consort, a year mm -hmm. god, who, um, who has to be sacrificed in order to bring fertility to the land, so he gets to live for a year. Um, and um, she addresses him in loving metaphors of the crop. She calls him, the honey of my eye, he is the lettuce of my heart. A f pretty fertile image there. It's a very fertile image. She has a lot of fertile images you want to hear. Well, why don't you give us some of the other side of her? I mean, she has these other, like, doesn't she destroy a few people here and there, too? Maybe you could read us that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, she has her famous praise about the song mm -hmm. of her vulva, so there's that side of her. That's, yes. Okay. Um, in the vanguard of the battle, everything is beset by you. My lady, flying about on your own wings, you feed on the carnage. Okay, so again, this kind of gives the sense of these mm -hmm. two sides of, of Yes, her. so not only is there an Inanna Eresh Kigal polarity, mm -hmm. Inanna within herself represents all aspects of the goddess. I wanted to say that you um, call your book a source book, and indeed it is, and that um, for me, one of the pleasures and treasures of it is just to open at any page and one can find poetry that's very moving and beautiful and deep, or new images of the goddess. And because you give us the goddess, I mean, because you, you know, we're not getting a third or fourth hand. I mean, and you, with your consciousness and your sensibility, are translating it. So we have. Um, these, these images of her, and any woman can like, who might be looking for images of the goddess can look through the book and find this. And also, it was such an incredible source of, of, of rituals and spells. I mean, because you can really look and say, oh, well, this is something that Juno did in Rome, or that the, yes. the priestesses did here, or here's an image. Um, and there was one particular one of uh, the moist earth mother who was a proto-Indo-European goddess. And we looked at Anana and Eshkigal, who were uh -huh. um, from this um, the, the female-centered theologies, and I thought it'd be interesting to take a goddess from the, you know, the proto-Indo-European when these two cultures mm -hmm. were more separate, and um, maybe you could talk a little about the proto-Indo-European goddesses and talk about the Earth Mother and read something for us. Okay, very briefly, the only proto-Indo-European goddess whom I th goddesses whom I think really exist, and proto-Indo-European means the goddesses who came along in the migrations right. with the Indo-Europeans from the, probably from the Russian steppe area. Uh -huh. The only ones I was able to, to find by doing uh, not only uh, comparative myth but, but um, cognate names, linguistic analysis, right. were a goddess of the dawn, a sun maiden, an earth mother, and perhaps a goddess of the stream, and that's it. So yeah. they're, they're um, obviously personified natural phenomena, mm. and they don't have a huge amount of myth compared to the more uh, 
richly and endowed, assimilated goddesses, goddesses who were already a part of, of Neolithic Europe. But one of my favorite Proto-European goddesses is called Mati Sira Zemlia, Mother Moist Earth. Mm. And she's very um, richly ritualized for a Proto-Indo-European goddess. Uh, she was a goddess of the Slavs. Mm -hmm. um, and you want to? I would love to hear it because I want, in reading through, it was such a source, like I said, of rituals. Mm -hmm. well, I'll just let my reader or listeners enjoy this. OK. Among some Slavic peasants, in the month of August, there was a custom which prescribed that they go down to the fields at dawn carrying jars filled with hemp oil. They would turn to the east and invoke the goddess, asking her to subdue every evil and unclean being so that they might not cast a spell upon them or otherwise harm them. Then they'd pour oil upon the ground. In religious terms, they were pouring a libation to the earth. Turning westward, westward they would ask Mother Moist Earth to engulf evil beings in her burning fires, that is, in the fires of hell. Turning to the south, they would further invoke the goddess, begging her to calm the south winds, moving sands, whirlwinds, and all bad weather. At length, they would turn to the north and ask the goddess to, cal to calm the north winds, the clouds, the snowstorms, and the cold. So the earth was in control of all the elements. Yeah, um, <coughs> again, in the translations, it's, there's such a scope. I mean. Uh, it counted almost close to 15 languages. I mean, you've got ancient Sumerian, you've got modern mm -hmm. Lithuanian. You know, I mean, uh -huh. we expect Greek and Latin from you, where <laughs> you know, but you know, we've got mm -hmm. Gaelic, we've got you know all these, um, and you go into to, like Sanskrit, and you know, from mm -hmm. different like texts and hymns, mm -hmm. and uh, folk songs and and poems. So uh, that sort of again for me is the heart of the book, and it's something that I think that um, women and men can turn to and look at, and you know. And, and because the way you, you structure it, then like the main part of the book is um, you take the eight pantheons. You take eight, you know, like the Balts, the Slavs, mm -hmm. you know, Greek, Roman, um, India. Anyway, you, yeah, just, actually, you, uh, the you Welsh know. goddesses, uh -huh. Gaelic, Irish. Um, so, and then you look at all the mythologies and you take, um, you know, the comparative iconography, and, and it's always the book is cross-referencing itself, and it's always going back to the sources, so it's always like weaving and integrating, yes. you know, so... The uh, goddess weaves herself. <laughs> <laughs> well, she, and you helped. <laughs> um, so I thought it would be interesting to take, like, a fate, and I have a certain, I mean, a, a theme, I have a penchant for these fate goddesses, so I, uh, I wanted to take fate and Great. as a theme or a subject and maybe look at her in some of the different um, pantheons. So, Wonderful. Okay. Um, I, I assume that, that at the beginning one of the most important functions of the goddess was that of determining the fate of humanity mm -hmm. because she was in control of all things anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. Um, well, actually, the most important goddess in the Baltic, the Latvian and the Lithuanian pantheons, was the goddess of fate. Her name was Lima. Mm -hmm. And um, together with, I mean, there, at the, this is relatively late. We're talking um, up at least until the 19th century CE. So there was also a, a male deity, and, and the two of them pretty much controlled life and, and the elements. Um, um, one poem addresses Lima very typically. Where did you sit, dear Lima, when I was born from the mother? Did you sit on the seat of good luck or in a pool of little tears? And that's a folk song, right? There are, yes, yes. Um, and uh, there's there's different one thing, and sometimes these fake goddesses are connected with snakes. Like there was one in the um, the Greek Pythia, um, yes. the, and she was a prophetess. I mean that they're connected with these oracular powers. Always, like Always. that. There's um, you know we have the Moira, the, who are the fates in in Greece, and mm -hmm. you know goddess of Nemesis and mm -hmm. things like that. But that you know that sort of the mortal priestess. Um, yes. Uh, there was actually one I want to read if I can find it here. Let's see. Uh, I think it's 120. And 
and this is just an example for my viewers of some of the richness of it, of um, these images that can really uh, move you as poetry and set you thinking. Like here's um, a description of Pythia. It says, and after death she shall not lose her art of divination, but she shall travel around in the moon, mm -hmm. becoming the so-called face that appears in the moon. <laughs> well, where does this come from? I mean, we don't get that sense in, um, you know, we get the sense of the Greek goddesses that they're laid or they're fractured from the earlier great mother, but in your book you really give us a different sense of them and a lot of their different powers. And furthermore, the, the Pythia was the goddess of prophecy. Um, Apollo simply took over the whole oracle and took over the goddess and symbolically slew her. Okay, is there another particular uh, fake goddess that you <laughs> like? Because <laughs> I know you like deal with them in, I mean, not all the pantheons, but most of the pantheons you discuss. Them. Yes, yes. Um, the fate and fortune goddess was very important in India. Mm. and. Um, the goddess of fortune was called Lakshmi, and her polar opposite was called Alakshmi, which just means absence of fortune. Um, and sometimes they're pictured as two sides of the same coin, which I think is important because we're always trying to split the goddess, and it's mm -hmm. important to realize that she wasn't always split and polarized, that she was a total entity. So, for example, um, the Hari Vamsha tells us, you, Lakshmi, go with hair dispersed, and as death you love moist flesh. You are Lakshmi, fortune, and Alakshmi, misfortune. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, and again, part of the thesis of your book is when these goddesses have these um, multifunctions, then you know that they come from these earlier source goddess cultures. Yes. When, when you can see that they have lots of attributes, and again, you're, you uh, linguistically and with the iconography and just through your translations connect them all. One of my favorite ones was um, Fortuna who's in, mm -hmm. in Rome and there was some <laughs> some line that just like pierced my heart. It says, she who can turn triumphs into funerals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks God. <laughs> and, uh, but however, she pours forth in plenty and abundance Maybe as you can well. read some of that. That was a rich... Well, the one that you were talking about, O oh, goddess, ready to raise a body from the depths, from its mortal station, or to transform splendid triumphs into funerals. Yeah. <laughs> but is there one above that where it talks a little about her, that sense of good fortune or prosperity? Mm -hmm. Fortune holds in her hand that renowned horn of plenty, not filled full of ever-blooming fruits, but as much as all the earth and all the seas and rivers and mines and harbors bear. So much does she pour forth in plenty and abundance. Hmm. Is there any other fake goddesses or any particular translations you might want to look at? Or well, uh, she's um, the the fortune goddess in in Greek. What wasn't as well known as mm. the Roman Fortuna. Her mm. name was was Tyche, mm. but. Um, for example, when men arm themselves for the battle that destroys men, then the goddess stands by to bestow victory and gladly grant glory to whom she will. And she, she, she was able to give all things, like fortune and fate give all things to man. Hmm. Now, they don't say to woman. But <laughs> well, I was um, interested that even in, in the Egyptian hieroglyphs that the... Um, ideogram for, I guess it was a snake was the same as for the priestess mm -hmm. and goddesses. And the, the goddess has a bird in, in her ideogram. Uh -huh. I wanted to take a little break here and look at, um, in addition to all your translations, there's photographs in the book that uh, were taken by your husband, uh, yes. Gregory Dexter, and I know you, there's, I mean, I've seen a lot of goddesses, but there's images here that I haven't seen. So I just wanted to uh, give my viewers a treat to see some of the uh, illustrations that Wonderful. are in the book. So let's take a look at those.
Okay, we're back in the studio now. Uh, I was thinking it might be interesting, too, to take a look at, you know, we always think of the goddess as love, I mean, Venus or Aphrodite, mm -hmm. but um, maybe to, to take her in her earliest roots and just look at some of the, um, the, the goddess in different pantheons that started her um, roots in maybe Egypt or... Certainly. So we're skipping over Inanna, who was also well, a, a Inanna was a love goddess. We talked about before as, as also being a love goddess. Well, she has someone's the lettuce of her eyes. Yes, so exactly. You know exactly. Um, the Egyptian Hathor was also um, well. She was multifaceted. Again, she was a love yeah. go goddess. Um, they they prayed to her. I adore the golden lady. I exalt her majesty. I fashion praise for the lady of heaven. My song of praise for Hathor. And that's because she uh, directed this man's mistress to him. <laughs> but she also, <coughs> excuse me, had her flip side. So um, Hathor, this goddess went out. She slew humanity. So she, um, she, again is a is a fully fashioned goddess. But is there some line there? And she's like, I slew humanity, and it delighted my heart. <laughs> And that, uh -huh. Those are the little exactly. touches. Yes. That, like, they make the goddesses really alive when you get uh -huh. those little lines uh -huh. that really give it to you. And also, she's uh, sometimes a cow-woman hybrid. Yes. Uh -huh. And she ties into like you to know, Juno. Yeah, that wife love aspect yes. or golden Aphrodite. And mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting to see how much fuller the, the depictions of the goddess were in in the earlier cultures and how one once they reach the classical era, their um, Aphrodite gets one attribute, Hera gets one attribute, um, Athena um, gets one attribute, and they just become divided up. But even in your book, though, you show how, you know, even they still have more functions than we would think, because even you have an imagery of um, Aphrodite uh, Defending some city, I guess it was the Spartans were the pretty Spartan well, you know, mm -hmm. or um, looking at Artemis. Um, <clears throat> you know, we think of her as the goddess of the hunt, this virgin. But there's imagery of her uh, holding a torch with snakes, or oh. even there's and she's invoked for childbirth. Exactly, childbirth, or there's a, a touching uh, description of her with her head very poised, leading the circle dance. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, and then we have these other love goddesses like Freya in the German pantheon yeah. who has two cats that mm -hmm. pull her chariot mm -hmm. and she um, is, is invoked that way but yet she's the first Valkyrie one of the war goddesses but yeah. but it isn't just like love and war but it's like it's, it's all things yeah it's like birth and and mm -hmm. I mean it's this the force of life or the, this death I mean it's a seasonal thing too and yes so we, we have all these um, and again some of the the rituals that I I just found so touching, like the the Juno at the heroine, where there's this description of the virgins coming. Oh, at Lanuvian. Yeah. yeah, and um, I, I thought that the Roman pantheon yeah. would probably be pretty dead or pretty much over, but you showed to me like that there was still a vitality in yes, it, like in that indeed. descriptions of the virgins coming to the cave and offering the snakes, and if they're pure, the snake accepts it. Exactly. Or go ahead. One find one finds I think more originality in the ritual. The, the Roman ritual that was that was theirs, and and the mythology is is very much borrowed from the Greek. Well, we just have a few minutes left, and uh, I want to make a statement and then ask you a final question, which is, I just want people to realize that this book is really for use, and you don't have to be a scholar, you know, just a, a woman or man interested in finding out about the goddesses, and that there is so much information, and it's such a treat to have these translations. So, you know, I want to commend you for that, and to you, urge Sarah. people to look at the book and use it. And also to say I thought it was a brave book because, um, you know, you called yourself an esoteric ivory tower feminist who became pragmatic. And, um, you know, you, you said that this is a patriarchal world and it's out of balance and it's killing us and we need to turn to these values of the feminine, of connectedness. And I wondered by doing that if it made the book harder to read, I mean harder to, to, to get published, and if it made it harder yeah. um, for you know patriarchal institutions like universities to accept it blind to their own prejudice. So I just wanted to ask you about your purpose in writing the book. And My purpose in writing the book was a need to get it out, mm -hmm. and a, a compulsive need to let people know what I knew about the goddess because I've spent half my life 
researching her. I mean, she's just so important to me that it doesn't matter whether or not I'm accepted because I write about her. I also felt it was extremely important to get out the message that we need a balance in our spiritual lives. And the goddess represents to me the other half of what Western society should be honoring. Because Western society has honored a patriarchal warrior model for so long, it has demolished the earth, de demolished the air, depleted the waters, de depleted us of, of all of the good things that she's given us. Well, and thank we need you, to Miriam. restore ourselves. <laughs> thank you for that message of hope and the hope that's in your book. And I want to thank you for being my guest. And thank, thank you for you, watching. Star. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.